I figured in honor of America, I'd better get off my ass and write more of the ongoing story featuring the legendary America-san although he doesn't get much screen time in this run. Here's hoping that permissage isn't still a thing, otherwise this thread's gonna die in a jiffy. Jummers. Standard rules apply this thread doubles as Shadow Run General. Let's keep Shadow Run alive on TG. And now, the story of, the Trout Run. Devish was the first to growl his thoughts. Oh, you got a lot of nerve, asking us to do that, Mr. Johns. He was suddenly silenced by a jutting hand. His teammate, Bent, was reminding him of the etiquette of the Johnson meet. Speaking out of tone was Febotten, especially with a high-class Johnson like the generically handsome, primly cut individual sitting across from them. Whichever megacorp he worked for, it wouldn't do well to insult them by proxy. Ben glanced nervously towards Geppetto, the team face us in de facto voice of reason. The team had always had a calm sort of understanding about this kind of thing, even since the days of 2D. The hacker was in charge in crisis situations, when having all the information at hand meant all the difference. Otherwise, all authority during impasses went to the face of the mage. As Geppetto qualified for both of these roles, he was the immediately recognized team leader. Which was why it bothered Ben so much to see the one Satanist wavering, especially this creature which he'd never seen hesitate even in the face of indescribable cruelty and butchery. Geppetto's thin brow wrinkled with a mixture of emotions disgust and contempt mixed with a sharp twinge of perverse humor. He could not help but choke up a strained laugh. Could you repeat that offer, Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson, his face organized in a bland, surgical passivity, did indeed repeat his offer. The job is to retrieve the man known as Trout from the Metroplex prison colloquially referred to as the tower due to its distinctive shape on 6th and Spring. My employer seeks his audience. Geppetto couldn't help himself. His composure buckled. By all that creeps and stings. Mr. Johnson. Why? That is for my employer to know. And not for shadow runners to guess at. My employer chose you as his first option because of two of your numbers considerable experience with the target. We contacted your replaced third, by the way Millie laughed, addressed me as a prank calling cockbite, and blocked further communication. Mr. Johnson adjusted his tie. I suppose given light of extenuating circumstances I can show more leeway on what was initially supposed to be an intentionally small starter's fee. An invitation to future work. What kind of leeway are we talking? Mr. Johnson Geppetto's eyes twitched involuntarily as text scrolled across the screen of his contacts. He noticed Dervish and Ben blinking and reading. 2. Wildcard had a keyboard and multiple AR windows up, and was hastily typing away. Hold on I have an idea. Johnson made note of the typing hacker, but turned back to Geppetto. I'm prepared to offer a 30,000 sum with a 10,000 expense account. As that is already extraordinarily generous, I do not plan on being bartered far up from it. That, of course, meant that he was quite open to an entire evening of barter in Johnson doublespeak. However, after a few seconds of scrolling, Geppetto found that the text read, Hurry things up contacting Brianna remember how there was going to be an opposing run to this one they're having their Johnson meet right now too if we finish now we can get them before they even start. We can turn this into easy money by hitting them right after the Johnson meet. Geppetto could not help but allow his fangs to slip through his lips, a malicious grin bubbling its way to the surface. I understand completely, Mr. Johnson. And in light of as you put them extenuating circumstances, I do believe that the sum will do quite nicely. However, my hacker has graciously informed me that we have another appointment, so if you could send him the rest of the intel via data chip. Mr. Johnson cocked an eyebrow as he tapped away at his comlink, before inviting Wildcard to interface with it. Wildcard popped the plasticine port where his spine met his brain, trailing out the long, thin cable of his data jack. Another appointment already? I feel almost slighted. But then I suppose that many shadow runners are busy people. Do show better form in the future, Geppetto. Geppetto made a curt little bow, showing deference to the Johnson, as Dervish and Bent stood to prep the car, suddenly over the tense precipice of the Johnson meet and thrust, quicker than they ever had been, into the job. I apologize wholeheartedly, Mr. Johnson. I assure you that we have your best interests at heart. Geppetto led the team swiftly out of the club, buzzing with nervous energy. Geppetto got like this when there were murders to be done. Following him were Bend, resigned, wildcard, detached, and dervish, resolute. Everyone suit up. Where's the enemy Johnson meet located? Wildcard gestured to a map of the city, pointing out a section of Tacoma's tourist district. Fancy well, fancy as a Mexican restaurant can get anyway, on Pier 64, downtown, 
but on the Tacoma side of things. Yak territory. What's the drive? 45 minutes. Geppetto gave Wildcard a stern glare. Without bucking, Wildcard followed up. I'll make it in 15. The team piled into Wildcard's high and die, buckled their seat belts, and the job was on. With the clever abuse of a few streetlight hacks, Wildcard had the team outside Maximilian's fine Aztec cuisine in 8 minutes and 52 seconds. Geppetto ran the plan over with Ben, so, we don't want to open up guns blazing in the middle of the street, but we want them out of the picture. This job is on you and me, Ben. Right now, I need samples from all of them hair, skin, blood, whatever you can make. I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you unseen, and Dervish and Wildcard will be ready to go as backup if things turn ugly. Geppetto gestured to Wildcard's car, and the passenger side window rolled down long enough to give him and Bend a glimpse of an armor-plated fist done up in red, white, and blue giving a thumbs up sign. Bend nodded, but his expression was grim. You're going to use ritual magic, aren't you? Geppetto licked his lips. Oh yes, and I'm going to savor every minute of it. I'm a $60 contributor. What can I say, I wanted the Doc Wagon card. Speaking of Doc Wagon, with the campaign that gave birth to Shadow Run story time officially over as of a month ago, I can tell you that by the end of the story the team will have run-ins with Doc Wagon, the Sicilian Mafia, Universal Omnitech, as technology, Raz including Firewatch, Horizon, Amazonian terrorists, the Ancients, Cedar Crop including Drake Prime, no less than 5 great dragons, directly and indirectly i.e. through minions or representatives. Hell itself, more hapless chain restaurants. Look forward to it, for the finale, in particular, I hope to put out a call for draw fags and see if I can't get the whole thing illustrated, post by post, before I put in on TG. Bend frowned and furrowed his bro, but with a brief huff of air he put on his goggles, slinking towards an alleyway just off the restaurant. As he shed his overclothesa hoodie and a pair of jeans into his ruthenium polymer coated bag and activated his tax suit, he remarked to Geppetto, I'm doing this for the good of the mission, but don't expect me to stand around while you're doing the deed. The rival team exited the restaurant soon enough. The first was a social infiltrator, female, she was human, and some man of Asian, although her body was so statuesque it screamed of plastic surgery, in her blood red gown and AR shades. She practically wore her shadow running on her sleeve. With a flick of his monofilament knife, Bend pocketed a single lock of hair. One target down. Looking like for to go. The rest of the team exited the double doors of the restaurant as a mass. One of them a troll with a mana ebb that flowed around him. Deflecting some of Bend's awakened sensor skilled quite literally qualify as a mass. The next was a hermetic magician. Done up in typical wizard fashion. Wearing spectacles and a long coat adorned with spellbooks and fetishes. Following him was the hacker, a geek in a trench coat with slicked back black hair, big retro shades, and boots that looked like they belonged in a fetish club. He typed at a shower's link distractedly, looking up public documents on the Metroplex prison. The final teammate, picking up the rear, was an orc gun adept. Her body radiated tense physical strength and incredible acrobatic ability, and her reedy muscles were taut against a tight tank top. Her bent arm grasped absently, reflexively, at where a trigger would be, where a rifle slung over her shoulder. Slowly, ritualistically, Ben unlinked the chain from his monofilament chainsaw. Stretching it and gauging its weight, he began to trot towards the clump of shadow runners, the movements of a gymnast about to perform his routine. And perform he did. Ben pirouetted through the shadow runners, chain taut in his fingers, in an instant grinding bone shavings off of one of the troll's nerveless dermal deposits. Slicing hair from the mage, hacker, and adept. As Bend Gecko gripped up the wall of the restaurant behind them, the adept felt absently at the back of her head, shuddered, but continued to walk. Bend growled into his subvical mic, what a senseless waste. At the directions of Geppetto, the team soon found themselves in an abandoned municipal playground in one of the poorer factory worker neighborhoods in Auburn. Musing and cooing to himself, Geppetto strode about the rusted playground equipment, tapping purposefully with his loafers. What exactly is it we're looking for Geppetto? Dervish sat on a dented plastic bench, looking bored. He was out of his armor again, now back in his biking leathers and bandana. He noshed on a fast food burger, having not had time to eat at the Johnson meat. Company, my friend, or a portal there too. Geppetto began kicking around the roots of an old tree near the sandpit, and something gave way. Brushing at the dirt with his foot, he uncovered what looked to be a capped manhole. 
Wildcard hazarded the question. What kind of company are we talking, Chama? You need a sample from the target. You could kill a guy in Bolivia if you have enough of his toenail clippings. Multiple participants can cast the spell, allowing for some stupidly high force spells. Geppetto gestured for Dervish to help him with the manhole, and began lifting, although he quickly gave way to the strain and let Dervish do all the work for him. Think about it. Shamanic lodges are set up all across the country for young spiritualists to learn the ways of their newfound talents. The urges are led to the churches and temples of their gods, to hone their powers through faith. Hermetics go to college to study magic like proper little scientists. But how did I learn to do what I do? Haven't you ever thought of that? Bend retched a little. He'd seen this man levitate another metal human into a nuclear spirit, slowly, excruciatingly, and consider it a perfect use of his magic later. No, I can't say I've thought of it, ever. Well, said Geppetto, gleefully, as he lowered his fancy loafers down onto a rusty rung, you're all about find out anyway. The rooms underground were surprisingly complex, a system of intricate stone-lined hallways carved with symbols of the obscene and depraved. There were crunches of bone underfoot, and the occasional scrap of a tiny shirt or dress. No one wanted to ruminate on why the playground above was abandoned. See, opined Geppetto, as he flicked on a flashlight out of courtesy he could see in the dark naturally. The very nature of black magic is that it's adversarial. It stands as the enemy to every other magical tradition. I mean, not in the way that the bugs or the toxic serathos are legitimate fucking menaces. After all but the point is that since we draw our focus on our power from all those storybook tales about Bujiman snatching children and enchantresses seducing good Christian husbands, well, it's not like we can up and put a church of everything horrible and bad that stands against everything you believe in across from the nearest Mormon tabernacle, can we? It's not against the law to be a black magician per se, but let's just say that the law frowns on our more colorful rituals. Ah. Here we are, Geppetto knocked on a slate wall, and announced. I am called Legion, for we are men it. The wall began to grind back, and greenish light spilled into the corridor from behind it. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, grumbled Wildcard. It's like a bloodly Lovecraft novel. As Geppetto strode into a charnel house filled with swinging, iron wrought cages, under the watchful eyes of a dozen ornately masked, black robed cultists, he giggled. Isn't it just? Bend excused himself at this point, and Wildcard commented that, as he was an expert in many fields but ritual magic was not one of them, he would rendezvous with Ben to peruse the Johnson's information and plan the next phase of the mission. Dervish stayed on with Geppetto as a guard, although he made sure to retrieve his automatic shotgun and America San armor before he'd cross the threshold. Geppetto and Dervish were led into a large, circular room, rent from the stone with magic to resemble some gothic nightmare temple. A very small cultist stepped forward and removed her mask. What at first appeared to be a pubescent human girl swiftly revealed its nature. As it grinned, its long, gleaming canines betrayed it as a vampire, stuck in a perpetual state of eerie teenage limbo. And who is this that approaches my court? Geppetto bowed deeply and floridly. I am Geppetto of the Black Lodge, and Tartarus of the Merlins. My service to our lord is writ in soul and blood, and the adversary lives within me. This is my owl in the occult sense, my mortal servant. Dervish gave Geppetto a look but knew better than to protest. The small vampire giggled with delight. Aha, so we have ascertained your identity, Tartarus of the Merlins and Geppetto of the Black Lodge, she squealed, mocking his tone of voice, but not your purpose. My purpose, said Geppetto, producing four vials of hair and one of bone, is sacrifice. Although he opened his mouth to continue speaking, his words were drowned out by unanimous cheering and clapping from the dozen cultists circled around him, and the countless shadowy, cruel spirits that wafted through the air, wandering half manifested in a listless, desultory vogue. You have not forgotten your ways, Geppetto and Tartarus, beamed the vampire, her colorless face suddenly pink with orgiastic ecstasy. The Black Lodge of Seattle welcomes you, Dervish, said Geppetto, giving Dervish an intense stare that was half commanding and half apologetic. Place the vials on the center altar and then stand back that we might do our work, Dervish, trying to remain as detached as possible, approached the altar carved to resemble two skeletal, grasping hands and placed the vials upon it. He stepped back to the doorway and positioned himself as a guard would, a witness but not a participant. It was perverse, but honestly, seeing black magicians at work was more entertaining than the low-budget traditions and alleyway bum fights that Dervish's budget usually allowed for. As all of the cultists, 
Geppetto included thereby raising the number of participants in the ritual to 13, a meaningful number, knelt around the altar, a portal of flame opened above it, revealing the mage's targets. The enemy team sat around a table in one of their apartments, quietly discussing the job. The Black Lodge's spirits jabbered and jeered, all summoned to their masters to resist the drain of the tremendous casting that was about to take place. Burn them. An infernal fire spirit resembling a flaming demon yelled to its master more, cheerful suggestion than command. Bathe them in cinders until black bones remain. Drown them. Burbled a tentacled water spirit in response. Fill their lungs with water until it runs down their chins and rivulets. Geppetto's own guardian spirit, the immense black knight, hefted its machine gun and spat. Kill them slowly, master, that they might know terror before they die. Geppetto put his hands up, a universal gesture for silence. I believe that we will start with the troll. The highest force power bolt we can muster should suffice. The little vampire cocked her head at Geppetto. Why not a power ball? We could kill them all at once. Geppetto shook his head, briefly resembling a scolding schoolteacher. We want them to see each other die, one by one. Adversary exults in fear. Besides, Geppetto clucked, with a harsh grin, a power ball at that force would bring down the whole damn building, and we don't need that kind of attention just yet. Jack Hammer the Troll and Rosie the Orc Gun Adept were having a minor disagreement with Booker the Mage, Freak the Hacker, and Vixen the Face. Jack Hammer and Rosa were of the opinion that, using the access codes that the team had received from Mr. Sato a Japanese appellation similar to Johnson, Booker had been quick to unhelpfully offer, the team should masquerade as prisoners or guards and then ambush the breakout team when they arrived to capture Trout. Freak, Booker, and Vixen didn't like to get their hands dirty, and instead had suggested keeping a perimeter around the tower and the adjacent blocks. Keeping a network of spirits and agents up to look out for suspicious behavior. The argument was swiftly and unsatisfactorily terminated when, with a noise not unlike a guillotine striking a watermelon, Jack Hammer's head popped with such a force that bits of his skull embedded in the opposite wall. The team had a brief moment of confusion, before Booker, limbs twitching violently, went for his gun. Ritual magic. Fuck. In a senseless panic, the rest of the team split for the garage while Booker, rooted under the effects of a ludicrously high force body puppeting spell, drew his sidearm pressed it to the base of his chin and, eyes darting wildly in panic, involuntarily killed himself. Across the city, the vampire looked expectantly at Geppetto. The flaming demon behind her was panting with masochistic pleasure, absorbing her share of the spell's ludicrous drain. Geppetto watched from the screeing circle as the gun bunny and the face piled into the back of the hacker's America. The hacker pulled a data jack and hooked into the car, pulling out into the streets at high speed. Two down out of three, Geppetto and Tartarus. What now? Let's end it with a bang. Geppetto drawled. Wait until they hit a stoplight. Then, a fireball. The fire demon shuddered happily at the acknowledgement. Did we make it freak the hacker was tweaking, not paying attention to the road. Fuck. Man. Fuck. Who's hitting us? It's the other running team, said Vixen. Shaken. They got us first. I don't know how they got DNA on Booker, though. Only Jack Hammer's registered. You think they got it up close and personal? You think someone got that close? What if they got all of us? That's impossible, responded Vixen. Now I rate. No one's that good, right? Rosie. Rosie the gun adept briefly thought about this proposition, and then put her head down as their hacker detonated like a block of C4. Rosie woke up outside of the car, sprawled across the pavement. Pedestrians gasped and pointed at her and something to her left. She rolled to catch a glimpse of what it was, and immediately regretted it, only in part because of the pain in her side. Vixen lay in two halves in the middle of the street, with a bloodied car door a few yards off that looked like it had gone clean through her. Freak lay in scorched pieces all around the total car. Rosa couldn't help but shed a few tears. These people were her running team, they weren't exactly her friends, but damn it, she had fond memories of working with them. That is, until she didn't have fond memories of anything anymore. Finishing it with an alter memory spell, hissed the vampire. Delicious. It was a moment of inspiration, smiled Geppetto, giving Dervish a glance. Not feeling especially social, Dervish silently turned to head topside. Mr. Johnson had given Bend and Wildcard some good shit. First and foremost were complete maps of the tower, in addition to some limited mapping of the sewer system beneath. Not enough to fully navigate by the sewer, but enough to recognize where it exited to Metroplex prison facilities. 
There were also guard patrols and spider clock and times, which had a special significance since Johnson had managed to retrieve one of the spider's access ID and codes for Wildcard. Although they'd make sure to run it past Dervish and Geppetto, Wildcard and Ben began to formulate a plan. Mr. Johnson had given Ben and Wildcard some good shit. First and foremost were complete maps of the tower, in addition to some limited mapping of the sewer system beneath. Not enough to fully navigate by the sewer, but enough to recognize where it exited to Metroplex prison facilities. There were also guard patrols and spider clock and times, which had a special significance since Johnson had managed to retrieve one of the spider's access ID and codes for Wildcard. Although they'd make sure to run it past Dervish and Geppetto, Wildcard and Ben began to formulate a plan. Wildcard would hack some public access city planning nodes and try to get to Bend a more comprehensive map of the sewers. His recently acquired shape change power to squeeze up through a septic tank's drone maintenance shaft that connected to the guard's locker rooms. As it was the only bathroom that had direct line of travel to one of the spider nexi without passing through locked doors or sensor suites. Bend would then plug a sat link into the Nexus, and Wildcard would backdoor into it under the stolen access ID to start unlocking doors leading Ben to Trout. When Bend and Wildcard put up a discussion channel on the team's tack link and ran this plan by Dervish and Geppetto, Dervish was the first to point out a problem that Bend and Wildcard didn't have familiarity with. This implies that Trout possesses the capability to follow your orders and sneak out of prison with the same degree of professional competence as you, Ben. Well, he is a professional infiltrator. I've read his dossier. I expect him to keep up. Wildcard turned the volume down on the channel as Dervish and Geppetto got all of their laughs out. Okay, said Bend. Miffed, so he screams his presence to the world, apparently. Well, it's not like we have a way to control his every action and force him to be sneaky. Dervish thought for a moment. Hey, Geppetto, didn't you use your ritual magic to force that guy to off himself? Yeah, said the black mage but, I'd need a sample of his art. Oh shit. 30 minutes later, what was once 2D's apartment building as of early 2072 was now missing about a quarter of its prime mass. Judging by the dilapidated chemistry equipment interspersed with the rubble, a cram lab had probably exploded during a bust. Not letting the material go to waste, someone had used a girder to prop up a section of billboard in the gap. Before spray painting it to read Halloween Town, clown painted thugs wearing predominantly orange and black drifted around the building and the blocks surrounding it swigging mauled liquor, comparing firearms, and talking shit about rival gangs. Trout's blood, doctor laughs a lot, the ghetto as fuck Halloween a street doc, rubbed at the Jagallo greaser paint around his eyes. The dilapidated ones a condominium thumped with the sounds of horror call music and gunfire. Of course I have Trout's blood. He was so far in debt for all the bullet removals that I just started taking transfusions as payment. Not that his fucking ad positive helps much. Geppetto slammed his hands down on Laughs a Lot's desk, a vat grown wood model that might have been classy once upon a time, before it was blood stained and full of holes. We will take all his blood. Lawsalot gave Geppetto his best skeptical grimace as he began sorting through a stack of coolers. You guys aren't doing anything stupid, are you? Who? Us Dervish grinned idiotically. What gave you that idea? Another 30 minutes later. The team convened outside of the Metroplex prison to review their plan. Wildcard ran through the details. Okay, Bend. I've got the sewers beneath the prison mapped out. Since they keep cameras fixed on most of the nearby sewer entrances, you're going to be entering about a mile out, and walk most of the way there. From there, our prior plan applies. If you can't contort enough to make it through on your own, don't hesitate to turn into an animal of some kind. You do have that ability, yes? Ben donned his goggles and smiled. Yep. Just picked up shape changing before this job. Wildcard nodded appreciatively and continued. Good, good. You'll pop up through the septic tank. Use a water spirit to wash off if you need to. Plug me into the nexus so that I can open the doors. From there, Geppetto hits Trout with a control thoughts. And we get the ball rolling. Dervish nodded from the backseat of the car. Inspecting his shotgun to make sure that it was clean. Okay. What am I doing? You'll be with Geppetto. Since the plan hinges on him ritually casting a powerful spell, he'll need the extra security. Roger. Any more questions? Anyone? Bend, Geppetto, and Dervish all shook their heads with non-committal grunts. Ducky. Let's move out. Bend was dropped off at the nearest non-secured sewer entrance. In full stealth gear, he hefted his taser, activated the night vision on his goggles, turned on his cloak, and dropped down into the darkness below. His goggles displayed an AR feed from Wildcard, 
a map of the sewers. What they failed to account for were the den of HMHVV infected goblins he'd dropped into. Four stunted little men with grotesque, partially translucent skin hissed and recoiled, raising primitive melee weapons to defend themselves. I smell elf flesh, growled one of them. Ben gulped, but stood strong, mostly because he had the commanding voice adept power. Stay away, he demanded. The goblins blinked, but advanced. Stop. No dice. Don't hurt me. One of the goblins licked its lips. A little disappointed in himself, Ben proceeded to do the reasonable thing and balk it like a metherfica, goblins in tow. Not helping anything, he entered a no-matrix zone in the sewers and promptly lost his map. Ben abandoned all pretense of stealth, spamming his commanding voice with the hopes that eventually one of them would fail. Please stop. Stop please. Stop chasing me. I'm not delicious. Realizing that telling them to do things that were directly against their nature was probably the problem, Ben opted for another tactic. Could any of you tell me which way to the Metroplex prison? One of the pursuing goblins screeched. About three blocks south and then take a left, elf meat. Okay thanks. The goblins fell behind a little, confused as to why they'd all suddenly felt compelled to give their delicious prey directions. Ben took this opportunity to pull ahead, turn a few corners, and disappear into the sewers again, before making his way more cautiously this time to the guard's quarters septic tank. Ultimately, the pipe was a little too slim for Ben in his natural form, but a quick shape change into a monkey later, and he was dragging his gear up into the guard's quarters. Some days, being a mizad really had perks. Ben found himself in a maintenance passage adjacent to the locker rooms, naked and covered in shit, with a one gesture. His water spirit, a cheery old man in blue robes, appeared and hosed him down. Ben bowed in thanks, then put on his gear again. Slipping out into the lockers, Ben snuck past a few distracted guards, disappearing into the hallway. About halfway to the spider room, his comlink managed to sync up with wildcard again. Bend? Bend, you're running late. The entire team's been waiting on you. What happened? We'll talk about that after the job, responded Bend, over his subvical mic. No sense in running even later. Ducking into the spider room, Ben smiled at the oblivious spider, who had his feet up on the nexus, sipping a soy calf and reading an emag. He activated the ruthenium polymer coating on the team's custom sat link an expensive little toy, and plugged it into one of the nexus data ports. I'm in, said wildcard, Geppetto, you're up to bat, crouched in an alleyway a few blocks away, with dervish at his side holding four blood packs full of trout blood. Geppetto drew a magic circle on the pavement. Roger that wildcard. Keep an eye out for our boy. Joe Sekigahira wondered why he was walking out of his cell. He also wondered why his cell door was open. It seemed counterintuitive, considering it was well past lights out and this time was normally reserved for attempting to sleep with his ass to the wall. There was also the whole legs moving without him telling them to thing. That was a little weird. He walked across the prison yard and found that one of the gates was open, the one leading to the guard's quarters. He was a little perturbed at this development, he didn't want to get beaten up. As he wandered past the guards in the hallway, he began to wonder if he was invisible. He tried to look down to see if he was but his neck wouldn't respond. Eventually he found himself in a maintenance hallway above a septic tank drone maintenance port that was far too small for him. Was he going to escape? He wasn't quite sure, but he was fairly certain that it was part of some master plan that he'd come up with earlier, because he was awesome. Although he didn't remember ever talking to the elf standing across from him, Ben took a few moments to blink at Zombie Trout, who was staring at him very intensely, wavering back and forth and drooling a little. His comlink vibrated and he answered the call. Hi, Sean. Oh hey, Emily. I'm working right now. Ofo African folk music sounded loudly over Emily's end of the conversation. She was watching a nature documentary. So you don't have time to talk? No, I'm afraid said Bend, looking at Trout and then looking back to the sewage port that was way, way too small for him. I'm kind of in the middle of a logistical problem. Well, I don't want to bother you while you're at work, but I wanted to know if you'd be free to go to the movies this weekend? That new indie flick is coming out. Yeah, that'd be great Ben thought for a moment. Hey, you switched your major to veterinary science, right? It took Emily a few moments to respond. You he? Do you happen to know of any large, passive rodents that might be able to fit an honey don't know, like a one and a half foot wide tunnel in a squeeze? Emily didn't respond for another 15 seconds. Uma Capybara? That's great, thanks. I gotta run now, but I'll see you this weekend. See you this weekend. 
As Emily hung up, Ben turned to Trout with a wicked grin. Wildcard waited nervously at the sewer entrance, seeing the searchlights turn on, one by one. The tower had caught on to their missing man, and he had no doubt that Trout was chipped. He tapped a hasty message to Mr. Johnson. Should a target very soon were drop off? Mr. Johnson responded with a set of coordinates. Auburn Industrial Park. We'll have men waiting. There was a wump from the hood of Wildcard Super Getaway Car as Ben leapt on top of the car, covered in shit, carrying a very confused capybara also covered in shit, and being chased by goblins. Wildcard opened the passenger side door and Ben, stumbling like a developmentally disabled Dukes of Hazard tribute act, hucked the capybara into the back before rolling into his seat. Drive. As Wildcard floored it and peeled out into the city streets, Ben hastily contorted backwards to start buckling the squirming, shit covered capybara into the center back seat. Bend, yelled Wildcard, as two police interceptors pulled into pursuit. What? Ben yelled back, over the roar of engines. Why is there a giant guinea pig tracking human fesses all over my pristine car? Ben, it's a capybara, not a guinea pig. Why is Trout a capybara? Ben, long story, I'll take your word on it. Swiftly accelerating into the triple digits and finding a nice modest speed at somewhere around 150 miles per hour. Wildcard tore onto the freeway and began effortlessly weaving around commuters as a third interceptor and a flying drone joined the fray. Goddamn, this has got to be the most wanted chinchilla in all of North America, Wildcard noted over the subvocals. Dervish, Geppetto, did you get the rendezvous coordinates? It's a capybara, clarified Ben, native to South America. Dervish asked confused, over the subvocals, as he and Geppetto mounted his bike. What did you do with Trout? Long story, said Wildcard, meet an Auburn, hauling us through downtown. Wildcard intentionally rooted through Corp territories, ducking through the neighborhoods of the Sairi, the Aztec Pyramid, and the Raz Tower to force Lone Star to take less optimal routes. Hastily deployed security teams just complicated the chase, as by the time Wildcard was noticed his car was already a mile away, cycling its revolving license plate to invalidate security footage. Waiting in the parking lot of the industrial park in Auburn was a black SUV, with two men in black coats flanking either end of the vehicle, both had the obvious bulges of small caliber automatic weaponry on their persons. Wildcard's black Hyundai peeled into the parking lot at high speed, spinning to a stop by the SUV. The two men in black looked on, nonplussed, as Wildcard and Bend emerged. They were slightly less nonplussed when Bend opened the back door and produced the world's largest land rodent, covered in shit. We've got the target. Wildcard held the rancid capybara in front of the two agents. It made a squeal of discomfort. There was a brief pause, before one of the men in black stated the obvious. That's a capybara. A capybara covered in shit, noted the other, helpfully. Wildcard looked down at the shit-covered capybara, suddenly reminded that this was not normal procedure for extractions. He waggled the capybara in Ben's general direction, unintentionally splashing poo all over the hoods of nearby cars. Ben, fix this please. With a thought, Ben dismissed the shape change effect. Wildcard loosed a cry of dismay and terror, as he was now holding aloft a grown Japanese man, buck-ass naked and still covered in a thick film of human excrement, dropping trout who stumbled awkwardly and fassa planted on the pavement, Wildcard fell over backwards. He made a mental note to burn the suit he was wearing. One of the men in black took off his AR shades, finally dropping all pretenses of imposing mysteriousness. Mother of God, could you, could you wash him off, or something? Bend nodded. My pleasure, the water spirit from earlier materialized and, with a woggle bog noise, Trout was launched across the hood of the SUV by a horizontal geezer. Wildcard stood up trying desperately to brush turds off his blazer. His efforts were in vain. So are you gentlemen able to call the cop core off on this one? Because that former capybara was hot as a volcano out there, and I don't relish being hunted down for it. Mib 1 shook his head while Mib 2 strolled behind the SUV to retrieve the stunned convict. We'll handle it from here. Lay low for a day or two, and we'll have it all sorted out. Good to hear, said Wildcard, reaching out for the 30k cred stick that Mib1 was producing from his coat, briefly jacking it into his comlink to check that the money was good. He then turned to Ben. As for you, ya nonce, there'll be hell to pay for shitting up my car. Quite literally shitting up my car, in fact. Wildcard settled into the driver's seat, although Ben didn't get in with him. Instead, a kindly looking monk with flowing blue robes sat in Ben's seat, and gave him a little bow. 
Wildcard eyed the manifested water spirit suspiciously. Bend, what are you doing? Cleaning up my mess. Hold still. Wait hold on a eh? Woggle bloggle woggle. And that was how, as the two agents pulled away with Trout, Wildcard learned what it was like to have a car wash inside his car. Shadow run story time 14n. So yeah, I'm actually aware of Poland, if you're watching this, it seems like this video came out. Um, I've lined up a lot of Shadowrun videos, um, I love the story, um, it, and it's a good excuse for me to get them all hammered out to you, you know, just because I don't have the time to actually find stories, like, you know, I, I don't know, I think what's made this channel work really well is the quality of stories, like, you know, I, I love these stories, um, I think they're a lot of fun, but sadly that takes a bit of time to actually find ones that are worth doing, you know, because it's there's a lot. There's a, there's a lot that just aren't that good. I'm sorry, you know. Um, you know what fan fiction's like. Um, some of them just aren't the best, you know. And it's kind of hard to find ones that I think that are worthwhile doing. You know, things that, like you know, if I really enjoy it, I'm sure you guys would really enjoy it. So like, um, Shadowlands an ongoing series that I've been doing for a long time now, and I've got them all like you know sitting there. I just need to actually make the videos. You know what I mean? So it's a good way for me to give them to you. Um, I think this. It's 21, maybe 22 parts. So, um, we've still got another wee bit to go. Hopefully, we'll try and get the bulk of them done this week. So, that's great news. If you really enjoy the Shadowrun series like me, I think it's actually one of the, my favourite ones that I'm doing at the minute. Um, though, not so good for everyone else, sadly. So, sorry for the inconvenience and all that jazz. But, look, be back to it soon enough. And, uh... Hopefully I'm enjoying Poland at the minute. <laughs> um, I'm doing this a week before Sam, so like, um, hope you guys enjoyed and uh, maybe subscribe and all that other good stuff. And uh, hope you enjoy Shadowrun. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!